The horror genre has a vast array of subgenres, and one of the newest entries to the ever growing list is analog horror. I say this as if this is a brand new, fresh genre to hit the scene, but the truth is, traces of analog horror date back to 2016. However, with its recently garnered attention, it would not be too foolish to think that this was in fact a new thing. Given how fast the internet tends to work, Anything in the cultural zeitgeist could be assumed as being a recent development by public eyes, while not necessarily being conscious of the years of foundation laid down beforehand. Analog horror, now, is a widespread genre with a mass appeal, but it's easy to forget its humble roots. Back when it didn't really have a label, back when it was more niche than anything, and back when there were only a handful of careers really shaping and pioneering the landscape. Did these people know they were paving the path for others to follow, or did they just make what they wanted to make? The question, in retrospect, is ultimately null and void, as here we are in the present. Analog horror is a staple on the internet and presumably a staple in the horror genre as a whole, but only time will tell on that last one. And while this genre has accumulated praise from many alike, in the recent months it has also almost equally been the target of jokes and criticisms which is just a commonality for popular things on the internet. However, these persisted and remained prevalent, so much so that legitimate discussions and debates throughout the internet were held on whether or not analog horror is good or bad. A far cry from the discussion and praise analog horror was held to just two years prior. So, what went wrong? Well, it's a complicated question without a definitive answer that I'll try to explain. But in order to do so, we gotta go over analog horror, as in, what is it exactly? How did it originate? What are some staples in the genre? Its rise to fame and its eventual decline. So, if you'll indulge me for just a bit, sit back, relax, and enjoy the video. So, what is analog horror? In layman's terms, it's basically scary shit with a VHS look, and, well, that's not exactly wrong. The most consistent thing across this genre is the visual aesthetics. Almost all of these videos have those washed out, undersaturated colors complete with fuzzy, staticky gunk found within VHS tapes. So is it purely an aesthetic choice? I mean, these kinds of visuals are also a popular choice in the vaporwave scene too. Well. No, because the visual style is serving a greater purpose within the medium and ultimately heightens the experience. It heightens the horror aspects. You see, one of the main staples of the genre is its unworldliness. The crux of these videos are presented through either found footage or ominous local television and radio broadcasts, both with the common goal of revealing a reality that is not ours. The vagueness of that last stipulation leaves room for the creator to do with what they see fit. Whether that's leaning into the scary side or into the surreal side, it's dealer's choice. No matter what direction these take, in the end we are left with a picture of a warped and augmented reality that is very similar to our own. And this is where the VHS quality of it really starts to click. Seeing these events transpire through grainy footage shifts the focal point to a first person narrative in which we, the viewers, are now incorporated into the story. This is further exemplified by the genre's lack of characters. It feels like, somehow, we got footage from another universe, and we are getting just a small glimpse into their happenings, however terrifying they may be. The fact that this footage has been captured onto a VHS tape gives the whole scenario a bit of existentialism as well. I mean, go to any thrift store, you'll see piles of blank tapes there, and who's to say one didn't sneak its way over from another universe? VHS isn't a commonly used format anymore. It hasn't been for a while. They're disregarded, not really given a second thought. So who really knows what lies beneath these plastic shells? But that's what analog horror is. I would give some examples, but I'll be doing that later on. So the next real question is, how did it all start? You could look at films such as Blair Witch Project, VHS, and even Cloverfield to an extent and presume these were the origins, and there could certainly be a case for that observation. However, analog horror is cited as being a horror web original, meaning the genre originated on the internet. A series such as Marble Hornets could be considered the origin point, however, there's a couple key fundamentals of analog horror that are absent in this series. 
Instead, many credit Turkey London III for series CH slash SS for being the first analog horror series on YouTube. With his first video, simply titled Advertisement No. 1, premiering on January 16th, 2016. Admittedly, CH slash SS acts more as an ARG, but it was the first to establish the genre's tropes, most famously being presented under the guise of a television broadcast. This being an ARG may explain its cryptic, vague, and mysterious way of storytelling. Despite this method being an ARG staple, enticing viewers to speculate and talk amongst themselves, this would ultimately be the style that analog horror would adopt as well, asking the audience to participate and piece together the story as the world is slowly revealed. Months later, on October 13th, 2016, Troy Wagner, the creator of Marble Hornets, would go on to launch ECFA which, yet again, further built upon the foundation of what analog horror would become, but it's much more akin to alternate reality games, yet again. With the groundwork laid down and the concept cemented, all that we really needed was for someone to come along and define what true analog horror was all about. Little over a year later, on Halloween 2017, we would see this genre bloom and take form when we changed the channels over to Local 58. Chris Straub, also known as the creator of Candle Cove, actually made Local 58 way back in 2015 for the accompanying site, local58.info, in which this series would go completely unnoticed until all of its content migrated over to YouTube. So in actuality, Local 58 actually predates CH slash SS and ECFA, which may be surprising to learn considering what we were given feels like such a natural and final evolution of the previous works. However, the main difference, and really the defining feature, is that this was not an ARG. This doesn't have any larger story or narrative to unravel. It's almost episodic by nature. Each video is its own self-contained story with a beginning, middle, and end. There's room for speculation and discussion, but more or less, you get the full picture with every broadcast. This series would slowly accumulate a following over the many months after, until in August of 2018 when Nexpo would go on to make a video on the subject matter, exposing the series and ultimately analog horror to the masses. Around the same time, another analog horror series would crop up on June 29th called Channel 7, which unfortunately struggled with living in Local 58's shadow from the start, oftentimes seen as a knockoff or a poor copy of the latter, which is something we will talk about later on. But for the following year, these two were the only true analog horror mediums out there. The genre would grow in popularity very gradually. New series such as Gemini Home Entertainment and Analog Archives would sprout up in the later half of 2019. However, 2020 would end up being the year that analog horror would become mainstream. There are four main factors I like to credit for the rise in analog horror's popularity. Those four being The Quarantine, Five Nights at Freddy's, Mario 64, and Icebergs. I know it sounds like they don't connect at all, but let me explain. So in 2020, a major event happened, which I don't think I have to explain, unless you're watching this way in the future, but essentially everybody had to quarantine in their homes. This effectively meant people had a lot more free time on their hands and conversely, a lot more time to spend on the internet. Meaning if a person knew of analog horror or more specifically local 58, but never had the time to fully check it out, well, now they do. On the same note, this extra time gave individuals the opportunity to dip their toes in the genre and make their own analog horror content. Event Time Media Center and The Monument Mythos are some of the more notable series that popped up during this time. However, this quarantine also affected the Five Nights at Freddy's fan base as well, as the new year saw the series experience a resurgence in popularity. As Five Nights at Freddy's proved to be popular since 2014, but more or less saw a decline in interest around 2018. But the quarantine gave people ample time to catch up on all the convoluted lore, and at least per my own observations, a new wave of younger fans had the chance to discover the series. So as old fans came back and new fans came in, the series saw the same amount of popularity as it did back in its heyday, if not a bit more. This ultimately led to an influx of art in all forms, yet the ones that proved to be most popular and prominent amongst the fan base were the Five Nights at Freddy's VHS tapes which are technically considered analog horror, which I kind of disagree with because beyond the VHS aesthetic, these videos are emitting some of the main elements found within the genre. Despite my objections, I cannot discredit the actual quality of these videos. These are truly superb. 
However, given the story and setting these games inhabit, the birth of such videos make a lot of sense. Unlike the every copy of Mario 64 is personalized videos that seem to pop up around summer of 2020. Outside of a couple bad creepypastas, Mario 64 was never really subjected to any horror themed identities outside of things within the game that were deliberately designed to be scary. Which is maybe why this style of video caught on. It definitely exposed a wider audience to analog horror. Whether or not they fit in that mold, much like the Finance at Freddy's videos, are very much up for debate. But either way, it's also directly responsible for the rise in the anti-piracy screen style videos. But more importantly, led to the start of the whole iceberg conundrum, which you are probably well aware of at this point. Almost poetically going full circle, the popularity these icebergs exhibit once again ended up introducing more people to the genre. It's hard to definitively prove that these four events directly correlate with one another. And I'm not here to say if one didn't happen then none of them would have happened, but to me it's just an interesting timeline of events that transpired. With its newfound audience being recently acquired, analog horror really was entering its golden age. Discussion was at an all time high, new series were showing up left, right, and center. I, like many others, were all on board with what this genre had to offer. At this point in the timeline, analog horror certainly wasn't new, but it was still very young, at least in the grand scheme of things. However, as young as it may be, heading into 2021, it faced some problems. Problems that arose from its popularity. Despite the varying different bodies of work accumulating at this point, they all felt the same. Similar concepts, similar execution, similar identities. All drawing inspiration from the same source that led to the genre's creation. To say that every piece of work that comes out of these properties are similar by nature is a bold statement that I would not dare make. Obviously, there is some originality amongst the crowd, but it is within a sea of the uninspired. Even the more similar videos do have their own merits to admire, but there is no denying the commonality amongst them all. Perhaps going through a handful of these series, via a showcase format, would add credence to this claim. And of course, we gotta start with... Amongst the notoriety and coverage this series has gotten, it's almost impossible to offer a new insight or perspective that doesn't overlap with what others have already discussed. It's one of the founding fathers of the genre after all. This level of reception is to be expected. Despite the accolades, there are actually surprisingly few videos, only 9 in total. The first video, you were on the fastest available route is a rather standard video for the time it was made in, that being 2015. It's nothing too special, but that doesn't negate the solid execution we are given. It's the next video, Contingency, that really established what Local 58 was capable of. A broadcast stating that the United States has surrendered to the enemy, and even in the face of defeat, the television prompts its audience to take America with them to preserve the memory of this great land untarnished and uncompromised. The eerie existential nature of this video is effective because you, as a viewer, are directly incorporated into the story, and this would persist throughout the channel. However, despite being relatively self-contained, there are some forms of a larger narrative at play here. I for one like the more episodic approach, but the overarching narrative and world presented in Local 58 is subtle enough not to get in the way of the individuality of each video. I guess only time will tell if that still reigns true. Seemingly, the only consistent happenings across Local 58 is that each broadcast is hacked or hijacked, so to say. Things play when they shouldn't have been played. In weather service, an emergency alert system goes off warning people not to look into the night sky. Then only seconds later, they correct themselves and encourage people to go out and look into the night sky. Or in real sleep. At the very start, you'll see that the following text reads, This video cassette is non-transferable. It is intended solely for the personal use of Gerhardt Philip. ID 750117. These instances insinuate something rather nefarious going on behind the scenes, and it's why speculation and discussions are still held around the series to this day. Unfortunately, the same level of praise isn't really held for
Channel 7 may have not necessarily been the first analog horror series to follow in the footsteps of Local 58, but is one of the more notorious examples, at least in retrospect, as the creator, Aiden Chick, has gone to make more positively receptive series such as Analog Archives and Eventide Media Center, which I'll talk about later on. But this series has always been directly compared to its predecessor, which is criticism that I believe isn't completely unwarranted. This series wears its inspiration very proudly on its sleeve. However, what was given, and knowing what's to come, through perspective, Channel 7 can be viewed as a rough pilot of sorts. Its presentation and storytelling is very amateur in nature, although admittedly these qualities would improve over time. But it is plain to see that these were all efforts from someone testing out the waters. They may not have the technical know-how or the writing capabilities to match other series, but their passion was strong enough to go through with it anyways and undoubtedly learn along the way. Above all else, no matter your opinion, you can't say this series doesn't have passion behind it. However, that doesn't exempt it from criticisms. It is a bit too liberal with how much it takes from Local 58. And while the first couple of videos are episodic and self-contained, a little while in, a larger narrative starts to build. The story, and the way it's told, I am not much of a fan of. All things considered, it's a bit bloated and drawn out. There is a central mystery component within the series that is presented in a vague, convoluted way, and not so much so a interesting, captivating way. It's more interested in letting the community ask questions and piece together the puzzle than providing a satisfying or scary payoff. Admittedly, this has been a growing problem that's plaguing horror-based things on the internet as of recent, mainly indie horror, but that's a video for another time. Thankfully, however, instead of prolonging the series, they knew when to call it quits. From the first upload to the last, only 6 months have gone by with a total of 21 videos, which is actually quite a lot of videos for the genre, at least comparatively to other channels. It's easy to disregard Channel 7 and look at the work that precedes it, but at the same time, it's humbling to see someone's beginnings. But analog horror isn't always confined to the restrictions of television broadcasts, and to prove as such, we have This series guises itself as a made-for-VHS home videos, a home entertainment collection, I mean, it's in the name. While early on, these are set to the backdrop of wilderness educational films, and that would be the consistent and prevalent theme throughout such videos as World's Weirdest Animals, Storm Safety Tips, and The Deep Blue. Gemini Home Entertainment is not afraid to venture off the beaten path with videos exploring different subject matters such as artificial computer learning, sleep image visualizer, and games for kids. Just to name a few. These varying subjects serve more than just a creative purpose as they also serve a narrative purpose, as this series does in fact have a storyline. A storyline that is concise and relatively linear. It's not bogged down by speculative rhetoric or needlessly vague storytelling. This approach, in return, gives the creator much more freedom to fully flesh out the world. The world that is presented here is one slowly being cultivated by aliens to transform it into something more akin to their own home planet. As the series progresses, we come to learn that these endeavors were already successful with such planets as Neptune. One of the harder parts about doing large narratives such as this is the pacing. Revealing the world to the audience over time or conveying the unique history is a challenge. On one hand, it has to feel natural, and on the other, you have to tell just enough without over or under explaining. However, I can say that this series really nails the pacing, giving us just enough understanding and leaving us wanting more. This level of progression even works its way into the format it's presented in, as the more aliens take over, the more Gemini home entertainment itself loses its sense of normality. In the end, it's a hollow shell of what it used to appear as. These last two videos, at the time of recording, don't even start with a typical company introduction screen, showing just how thought out this world truly really is. To some, that may seem small, but it's ultimately the small touches that make the magic happen. Sometimes it's the smallest things in history that changes things forever.
The Monument Mythos takes both elements of analog horror and elements of alternative history to make something truly special. I am, however, a bit hesitant to classify this as strictly analog horror, as yes, some videos certainly have those visual aesthetics associated with the genre, but a good handful do not, however. That being said, the core of these videos are about showcasing a world that is not ours, which I believe is probably one of the more important distinctions. It's hard to say that these videos have an overarching narrative or a storyline. The events that transpire in each video are self-contained. What the monument mythos does have, however, is a world. And unlike Gemini Home Entertainment, this world isn't subject to drastic cosmic change, but instead minute, subtle change that oftentimes snowballs into bigger events. I assume your enjoyment in such a series is going to differ depending on how much you like history or the alternative history genre as a whole. Even then, they do have a more typical analog horror approach when it comes to such things as Liberty Lurker, Rushmore Revenge, and Freedom Faller. It's these particular style of videos that I assume this series is named after, as they all depict either historical monuments or landmarks experiencing strange and unexplainable events. I will say, however, some of the more recent videos, specifically the Windows Movie Maker ones, are noticeably a downgrade in quality. Of course, visually, this is intentional, but content-wise, it lacks the slow burn pacing and that surrealist storytelling angle. However, holding out hope that this is escalating to something. I mean, people only get better the more they do something after all. Case in point being... Analog Archives is created by the same person behind Channel 7, only premiering a mere six months after the last broadcast. Analog Archives is an improvement on both a visual level and a storytelling level. The framing device for this series is that of an archival channel, documenting, recovering, and cataloging seemingly lost media throughout the East Coast. The description of each video has information such as when the tape was recovered and when the tape was made, among many other things as well. There's no connecting factors between these tapes unless they were recovered from the same area, such as Tape 1, Safety and Information, and Tape 4, Physics, both being recovered from Bucks County, Pennsylvania, and both sharing a theme and spectral frequencies. In a way, this approach doesn't construct a larger narrative, but it does add further depth of knowledge to the connecting prior tape. In essence, through this framing device, these videos are episodic, but are allowed to have sequels or follow-ups if they so desire. This series lasted just over one year, spanning over nine videos in total. However, there is a considerable amount of time between the eighth video and the ninth final video, a roughly seven month gap between these two uploads. This is explainable due to the fact that the creator, Aiden Chick, would actually go on to launch yet another analog horror series called Event Tide Media Center. While the analog archives was set on presenting recovered tapes across the East Coast, Event Tide Media Center focuses on a small library of the same name, whose catalog of tapes showcases the strange happenings across Massachusetts. In a broad sense, it is relatively similar to the prior work at hand, just that the area of coverage has been centralized down to one state. This localized horror for some may be effective, but ultimately I believe it doesn't take enough advantage of its relatively small scale. The content may be new, and Event Tide Media Center may present itself in a variety of different styles, but in the end, I feel as if it's just a bit too similar to analog archives with there being very little distinction between the two. Kind of like how there's a clear distinction between Five Nights at Freddy's and its analog horror inspired counterpart. In my previous video, I briefly touch upon this series, labeling it as a Finance of Freddy's spin-off or spiritual successor. Even at the time, I knew that was a gross simplification of the Walton Files. In truth, it's definitely inspired by the Finance of Freddy's franchise, but beyond that, inspiration is really all it takes. Simply put, there's just too much to go over in this video, and quite honestly, it's not really my style of video. 
To me, it falls into the same tropes and cliches that ultimately plague both Five Nights at Freddy's and just indie horror games in general at this point. By no means is it bad, and I can totally recognize the amount of love and effort that has gone into fully realizing this story. And while I think prior investment in the Five Nights at Freddy's franchise should not affect current enjoyment in such a series, I do find that such an interest will go on to make the series more fulfilling. I feel very similar to the analog horror trend that was a recopy of Mario 64 is personalized. Except this time around, my years of playing the game growing up definitely aided in its effectiveness. However, being able to compartmentalize my nostalgia and set it aside, I can say that one of the main problems with these videos is that they ultimately rely on the same scenarios. They all end up blending together, and it's no surprise these videos only lasted a couple months before dying out. But it is this very problem that is currently underlying the entire analog horror genre. A problem I stated earlier, yet my examples have done very little to prove as such. With the exception of Channel 7, each series thus far has been unique or different, of course in varying degrees. However, these examples have been the exceptions and not the rules. The truth is, these series have been some of the more popular and positively receptive content within the series. And this whole time, I have been willfully holding back from talking about the absolute mountain of similar uninspired analog horror videos out there. In part, I frame this by showcasing what the genre could be to further emphasize what the genre truly is. The other part of the structure has to do with discussion. Quite frankly, there are a lot of these analog horror Local 58 inspired videos out there, in which I have nothing further to say except they all feel similar. They are all presented as local TV broadcasts and they stumble through all the tropes and cliches almost like they're going through a checklist. They have their own merits, of course, viewing each one on a completely individual level would heed some good praise. However, these videos have to be contextualized into the genre as a whole, and looking through it in that lens, these become very unremarkable, and in some cases, even annoying. It is rather reckless to generalize in this way. Diamonds do exist within the rough, like Rocket Records after all, but the sheer scope is rather jarring. Just to give an example, I'll name some series, and even by their names, they sound similar. Channel 49, Suburb Television, WWBN colon D, WLCB TV, Channel 4, Channel 2, Sunset TV, Channel 32, Channel 99, and many, many more. So while this genre does have its Gemini home entertainments and analog archives, the fact is those are often outnumbered by all the local television broadcast style of videos. This observation quickly became the general consensus at the start of 2021, and as the year progressed, more and more would come to that notion as well. More than ever, the genre needed something drastically new to revoke interests, and more than ever, now was the perfect time. And on June 9th, 2021, a new series would premiere which would almost single-handedly launch the genre into mainstream popularity yet again. However, this series would ultimately be more detrimental to analog horror in the long run. I didn't skip over it, I merely built it up. This is... To truly understand the impact the Mandela catalogs have already had on analog horror, it would be easiest to compare it to what Local 58 did for the genre. As in, Local 58 practically made the genre and has inspired countless others to follow in the same trajectory, as we already talked about. But the Mandela catalogs essentially remade the genre and completely reconstructed what analog horror is all about, for better or for worse. You see, while there are certainly remnants of what came beforehand, the VHS aesthetic still remains prominent and there are even some hints of television broadcast qualities to it, but ultimately, this series sheds all prior known conceptions of how these videos are supposed to be structured and instead forgoes with its own surreal and unorthodox presentation. If I could give any frame of reference, I would say these share some resemblance to Weirdcore in a somewhat obtuse way, but generally, the Mandela catalogs are just kind of its own thing. 
Now, clearly, this series struck a chord with a lot of people, and given a brief synopsis, it's actually not too different from something like Gemini Home Entertainment, with the shared conflict being a foreign threat slowly taking over. However, the main difference being that the Mandela Kelloggs thematically deals with religion. In fact, it's a staple in the story, because in the world, the Bible really did happen, and some prominent religious figures are present in the story. This theme probably played a large reason on why people gravitated to the series. A somewhat recent development on the internet is people being drawn to the Bible, not necessarily for any devout reasons, but rather in a strictly cosmic horror sense. The biblically accurate angels were ones that a lot of people latched onto specifically. Other than that, the Mandela catalog also has the intruders and alternates whose designs really give off that uncanny valley effect which in return can make some viewers feel creeped out. Only some viewers, that is. <sighs> I'll be honest with you guys, I don't like this. I don't feel scared or creeped out or perturbed or anything. In fact, I've laughed out loud at many things throughout this series. I completely recognize why people like this series, I acknowledge what's done, and once again it's hard pressed to call this bad when horror is so subjective. Maybe it was never my thing to like this series, but at the same time I only recently checked it out, and I can't help but think that the recently required reputation precedes these videos, and effectively lessens them by proxy. A reputation that followed in the Mandela catalog's footsteps. You see, Local 58 inspired plenty of Local 58-ish videos. The Mandela catalogs inspired plenty of Mandela catalog-ish videos. The genre was once a sea of local TV broadcasts and are now just a sea of distorted faces. Despite not being the biggest fan of the Mandela catalogs, I can at least understand what they get right. The crux of their horror isn't reliant on these scary faces, it's about the world building and ultimately the pacing that makes these faces the most terrifying things to stand out in the series. But because they stand out and shock and scare so many audiences, it's the first thing transcribed into any new series without fully analyzing why this worked in the first place. So, oftentimes, a lot of these Mandela catalog inspired follow up videos are simply reduced down to scary faces. And with the genre and series being ever so popular, that meant a lot of eyes were watching. Anything popular on the internet is bound to be ridiculed. And that's what happened in November of 2021 when people took to social media to post images and videos captioned as analog horror be like. A joke made to point out all the cliches and tropes found within the new Mandela catalog style of videos, although there were some aimed at Local 58 style videos as well. However, more and more memes were being made about analog horror, and while people laughed, there was something in these jokes that really resonated with people. There was a bittersweet truth to it all, and it ultimately made more people critical of what they watch now that they fully comprehend how commonplace these cliches were. It's within this newfound perspective that made people start legitimately discussing the quality and longevity of analog horror. That finally brings us up to the present. When analog horror is mentioned now, it's often a mixed bag of responses. Some people still love it, some people hate it, and everything in between. However, I feel like the common response now is that it's generally not all too good. People feel as if the genre is just parodying itself now, and I almost want to agree. Some people can blame the Mandela catalogs for the drop in quality, however, you can't blame a guy for making something he wanted to make. Does anyone really know they're paving a path for others to follow? Many will also say that the market is oversaturated, and it definitely is, and that certainly plays a part in it all. However, this genre was made on stock videos, photos, and music. The first three Local 58 videos were made on simply iMovie. All this to say, this was kind of always a genre of video that anyone can make which is equally a negative and a positive, but when framed through that context, it reveals another thing. I think we took analog horror a bit too seriously. Sure, it started as this very atmospheric creepy thing filled with small details to analyze, and the more prominent series are held to that standard, 
but the vast majority of this genre are just kind of goofy little scary videos. You can certainly prefer, or in some aspects demand, for the quality to be on the same level as these works. That to you is what analog horror is all about, and that's fine. But at a certain point, you have to look at your preconceived notions of what analog horror should be, and look around and see what analog horror currently is. Because when it comes to genres, ultimately, the body of work dictates what they are. So would you rather have something be obscure and niche in order to maintain quality? Or would you rather have that something become popular and see where that fan base takes it? For me, personally, I'd rather have more people in the know. I'd rather have more people make videos, not only to see new people, but also see new ideas and new creative talent on display. I know the quality will suffer, but I'll never discourage people from creating. So this genre may not be positively talked about as much as it used to be, but it got a lot of people into video making. And if you truly hate how the genre has ended up, don't worry. Local 58 came along and changed everything. Then Mandela Catalogs did the same thing. And I'm pretty sure there's going to be something else in the near future that will do the exact same thing. I mean, hell, it could be by one of you watching right now. If you want change, you can be the change. The genre is still young, my friends. It's not too late to make your mark. And to those who say this genre has no more ideas to explore, then you have a gross underestimation of people's imaginations. Thanks for watching.